So here we are on turn six. Enchantment is still going strong, as is our expansion. We're actually a little bit behind on expansion, I tell a lie. Um, ideally, we'd have two armies out expanding currently. But as you can see, we've successfully taken this province. I overdid it a little bit. We lost quite a few wolf riders. That's not surprising because they're very, very squishy. Um, and uh, I overestimated how much forces there were in this province. So we actually could have taken this probably with just the, the remnants of our starting army, which would have allowed the other half of the army to go do something more important somewhere else. However, we took this province. That's the important thing. We now have a very valuable province. Well, I say very valuable, it's only 92 at the moment, but later in the game this will be generating 200 maybe uh, per turn. This one I'm expecting to currently be about 130 income when we eventually take it. So there's a couple of things worth talking about this turn. First is that we finally found another player, with this I believe is Pangaea, who are ancient Greek mythical creatures nation themed around the idea of nature red in tooth and claw. They're all satyrs and uh, maenads and centaurs, all of the kind of animal people of, of Greek mythology. They're very, very strong. They're one of the stronger nations in the game and they tend to rely on their sacred troops. So there'll be someone to watch out for. There's also a mechanic which I haven't mentioned yet, but I'll bring up now because we're not talking about anything in particular this, this turn. Rather than having a standing army wandering around costing lots of money, you can instead invest in province defense, which is listed up here in the province details. For each level of province defense, it costs the amount of that level. So it costs one to get level one, two to get level two, and so on, which means that getting a low level of province defense is very cheap, but getting a higher level of province defense becomes debilitatingly expensive. These troops are automatically generated whenever a combat happens in that area based on whatever the province defense level is. Generally speaking, you won't be relying on your province defense to, to win a battle for you. However, they are a very powerful supplement to your forces if you have an army moving into a province anyway. And if you know your opponent is going to move into a province, you can massively boost the PD in that province alone immediately before they do so, which is called PD dumping. With a province that has uh, strong independence, such as a barbarian province or a province with heavy cavalry, that can actually be enough to, to win the battle without you needing to retask one of your armies. However, in a multiplayer game, the main benefit of province defense is that uh, it stops, for example, a scout taking a province by themselves. Once you have about three points of province defense, that's usually enough to fend off a single scout commander by himself. But your opponents don't get to see exactly how much you have invested in your province defense. At less than six points of province defense, they get one specific message. And then between six and I believe 21 points, they get a different message. And then above 21 points, they get a, a third message. So putting six points in is very common because it's just enough that it means your opponent will be unable to know exactly how much you've spent. Other than that, we're beginning to build up a second army in the capital. This is probably enough to start taking provinces. And I should probably have her march out and start doing stuff. But I would like one more turn of recruitment before I do that. I'm being very cautious, which is perhaps unnecessary. In addition, we're having uh, this spellcaster return to the capital to continue researching. I'll start sending out some site searches in a few turns, I suspect, but we can talk about site searching later. All you need to know for now is that that's how you get magic gems, and magic gems are how you cast spells. So we're moving this guy down into here, and uh, yeah, that pretty much should be it for this turn. Here we are, it's turn seven, and we have successfully taken another province. Once again, we're running a little bit slow, and I uh, I really want to try and speed up over the next couple turns, start taking multiple provinces a turn. The game generates with a number of provinces per player, with a certain assumption that, you know, a certain radius around your capital is your territory. We've also had an unexpected event. Every turn you'll get random events. So at the start of the game, we won't see very many of them, but as we, as we expand our territory, we'll get more and more. Other than that, there's not much to say. We've successfully taken this province. There's a couple of options for expansion right now that I would uh, that I've been debating over what to do. Obviously, we want to start moving our second group of troops out. I was thinking about sending them this way to take this, this, and maybe this, possibly these as well, depending on how they march around. And that might still be the better option. But this barbarian province, since I have the troops available at the moment, I'm tempted to try and take care of it. The alternative would be to send these troops this way and have these troops march into here and then here. The issue is that if I do that, I'm quite likely to start running up against whoever's over here at that point, which means I can't push any further this way. That wouldn't be a problem, except for the fact that this mountain range blocks travel between these provinces, and this throne will be heavily guarded because all thrones are, which means that I can't travel from this province into either of these two provinces, which means that once my guys reach here, they'll either have to just kind of turn around and take the long way back home, or have to pass through this province as it is. Or a third option that's just occurred to me is I could have these guys move, as I was expecting, around this way to take this province. 
And then one, two turns from now, there'll be enough forces here that they can swoop in from both sides and fight this province together. So provided I continue recruiting troops in my capital, which obviously I will, that actually there should actually be plenty for that to work. So I think that's what we'll do there instead, which means I should move these guys out this way. I'm going to move her to this province because we actually have a uh, commander in this province ready to take command of these troops. He's currently waiting for wolves, but uh, he can command anything and he has 40 points of leadership, which means that he can he can run some decent sized squads. It's not enough to use complex formations and it's not enough to have very many squads, but he can he can command plenty for expansion. The, the upside to this is that that means I can have this mage start doing other things. If I can build a lab here next turn, I can start recruiting Veti Hags, which, as we said, are very weak, but very, very cheap mages, which will quite heavily boost our, our research output if we start recruiting a bunch of them. So if I have to sacrifice a, a turn of research from a mage anyway, because I need I need her to be ferrying troops, I might as well get the benefit of having her in a position to do that next turn. That's really all there is to discuss this turn, so join me next time for more of this. It is turn eight, and who likes expansion? I like expansion. You like expansion. Why don't you join me for more expansion? So we took this province very easily, with no trouble at all. And it looks like it might actually be a large province. It's got a very unusually high population for a forest province, and a therefore unusually high income. This is going to be prime candidate for a fort later on. Generally speaking, you don't want to put your forts too close together, because, as I've said before, forts draw resources from surrounding provinces. So two forts drawing 45% of the resources from this province each is fine, but if I put a third one down, then all three will be receiving less. I've uh, been thinking about where to expand. I'm just going to follow my plan as planned. So from here, we're going to move down to here. I was thinking about pushing further onwards and trying to take these provinces first, which isn't necessarily a bad idea. Generally speaking, in Dominions, you should uh, expand with a sort of spider webby hub and spoke system rather than an outwards spiral so that you reach towards important provinces and then fill in the gaps later however i'm really keen to make sure that um the fishmen don't try and step their wet little feet up on land to take this province unsuspecting uh unsuspectedly so i'm going to sacrifice the opportunity to see some of these provinces out of the territories over here and it looks like we now have uh, contact with another nation we have marion over here so Marion's capital would be in this province, I believe. Uh, that's another reason to be careful about pushing over here. Generally speaking, taking one of the provinces adjacent to someone else's capital, this is called pushing into their cap ring, is considered an act of war no matter what the current state of um, politics are. Provinces further than one tile from your capital, so for example with mine, this province, this province, etc., those are, those are anybody's game. It's it's first come, first serve. There is an assumption that every tile adjacent or to your capital and every tile adjacent to those tiles, so, you know, a radius of two outside of your capital is your territory. But if you don't capture that territory before someone else does, that's on you. A cap ring, though, is generally considered to be yours. So given that, let's not try, let's try and avoid provoking Marignan early. One, two, three, four. Yeah, so if this is Marignan's capital. So to that end, we're taking this territory and we're also going to be sending our troops with Odvinter into this one. This is basically a worthless province at this point, but it's a convenient stepping to stone to this province. Then after a few more turns of expansion, I'll be sending whatever additional troops I've recruited into m in my capital uh, that have survived the battle with the barbarians that's going to happen the turn after next. There is a mechanic that I have forgotten to mention up until this point, which is mercenaries. You'd think I would have noticed that this big sign on the on the wall is right here, but I haven't. We don't really need assistance for our early expansion, but it's generally a good tactic on the first couple of turns to see what mercenary bands are available. There's a huge pool of pre-designed mercenaries in the game. They aren't randomly generated, there's a set roster, but only a few are available at any given time, and they are persistent, so if a band of mercenaries is wiped out, they can't be hired by someone else later. When you hire mercenaries, you get the guy and the men under his command for three months, and you can extend that contract for another three months for a cheaper price, provided someone else doesn't outbid you. And it is a a, uh, a silent auction. So if I wanted to hire the green men, I would make my bid, which I'm not going to do. <laughs> and if someone else bid higher than me, they would work for him instead. And um, that's that's how mercenaries work. Mercenaries are very useful for getting some disposable troops very quickly to eat up something like a cavalry charge that you don't want to deal with, or for filling in specific holes in your roster. For instance, if you need cavalry and you don't have any cavalry natively, you could hire some. But they are quite heavily randomized, a real risk that the ones you need won't be around. It can also be useful to get a hold of spellcasters that your, your nation doesn't have native access to. For example, a lich 
mercenary who is leading a bunch of undead troops. You might hire him just because you want a death spellcaster for a couple turns. Anyway, um, I'm pretty much spending my entire turn's income building a lab here for the reasons I've already discussed. Potentially a bad idea, because that means I won't be recruiting troops in my capital this turn. It's generally a bad idea to miss a turn of recruitment. However, I really want to get that lab down so I can start recruiting my insanely cheap 40 gold mages. And that, I think, is everything we need to discuss this turn. Well, friends, it's turn nine and we're doing fine, by which I mean doing mediocrely. We've successfully taken two provinces this turn, which is good, which because that means we've caught up to where we should have been, assuming a sort of, you know, average expansion. Uh, we've successfully taken both of these without any real trouble, which is good. We also started to get some unexpected events. Plus 25 resources and minus 100 population in this province. And also in this province, we've gained a bunch of gold and a shitload of gems. This is one of the luckier events you can get since it provides you a wide variety of gems, although uh, you can get much higher individual gem counts as well. So today we're continuing on with expansion. There's a couple of uh, decisions I've been making about how to plan this. I thought about sending these guys over here to seize this province. That's probably as far as I could get pushing into their territory, but I would not be surprised if Pangaea was about to take that territory as well, which means our armies would meet up at the same time, and one or the other of us would be randomly selected to fight the independents, and then we'd have to fight each other. So I'm just I'm, I'm just going to be happy to just have my territory and not try and get greedy and, and spread out too far. Additionally, I'd quite like to try and take this, and in fact, I'm recruiting a uh, stealthy raiding party of wolf guys to try and grab this forest province before, before it's too late. As I said before, I don't want to try and take either of these provinces because they're adjacent to Mariel's capital, which he'll demand them back, and if I don't give them, that'll be war. And of course, this would be Pangaea's capital, which means that these two provinces are fair game. The question is whether or not I could actually take them before he, he, he pushes them off, and whether or not he'd demand them from me. So instead of that, I've got forces moving in to take this barbarian province this turn. It's a bit earlier than I'd usually like to take a barbarian province, but um, I really want to grab this one. So after they take this, they can move to here and here, and I'll have maybe some further reinforcements marching south to join them. This group, I'm definitely just going to send off to march and grab these provinces around here. And next turn, I'll be sending someone north in order to try and grab some of these, because I haven't expanded very far north, and I'm a bit worried that I'll lose the opportunity to. In terms of neighbours, we currently know where Marion and Pangaea are. We also know that, of course, the fishmen of Pelagia are squatting in this lake. And I suspect that this capital over here will be Ashdod because it's a wasteland. No idea who might be to my southeast, or my northeast, or my northwest yet. However, my first real conflict will probably be to with whoever's to the north, because I don't really want to tangle with either of these guys. They both have strong, sacred cavalry. And Ashdod is just a pain in the ass to fight in the early game because they have strong, sacred giants. We have non-sacred giants, so it'd just be a big, giant slap fight, really. I've also started recruiting our Veti Hags. We can only get one every two turns because they cost two commander points, like all wizards do. You can get more commander points in a province by building a fort there, but we're not going to fort this, obviously. It's just that we get a little bit of extra free mage recruitment, even if it is only one every two turns. That's still better than anyone else is getting. So, um, yeah, the only other thing I want to bring up this turn is buildings. I just want to explain how they work real quick. There's four kinds of buildings, ultimately. There are forts, labs, temples, and magic sites. Forts, labs, and temples you can build wherever you want. Uh, a fort is a recruitment center that draws stuff from the surroundings, as I've explained previously. Um, and building forts is the only way to unlock the production of your national troops in provinces other than your starting province. They're also very useful for defense because you have to siege them down before you can capture a province that has a fort in it. They're also the only building that actually has like further stats, as you can see. These are the stats of my castle, and there's a lot of different kinds of castles in the game, and you can upgrade palisades into forts, into castles, and so on, uh, into citadels as well sometimes. Laboratories and temples just exist. Laboratories unlock mage recruitment, temples unlock priest recruitment. Additionally, temples generate checks that push out your dominion, and laboratories allow you to cast ritual spells in that province. You can't cast ritual spells in a province that doesn't have a laboratory. Finally, there are magic sites, which is... Much like Commander, a generic term, there are a ton of magic sites that are in no way magical, such as the only one we currently have, the Arena. It's completely unmagical, but it just brings in 25 gold per turn through, you know, commerce. It's an entertainment building. So I believe these are actually seeded at world generation and fixed for the entire game, but they are hidden. So in order to find magic sites, one of the tasks that you can give a Commander is site search. If you tell them to search for magic sites, then next turn, any magic sites up to the level of that spellcaster's spell casting will be revealed. So for example, if this one site searched, then level one death and nature sites would be revealed and level two blood sites would be revealed. 
Level 1 is enough to discover something like 70-80% of sites, level 2 is enough for about 90% of sites, and then level 3 is enough for all of the rest. I believe there's only like 1 or 2 level 4 sites in the entire game. So generally site searching to level 2 is, is worth doing, and in a few turns when I have enough spare spellcasters, I'm probably going to send one of each of my types of randomized wizards out to, to do that. One with high death, one with high nature, one with high blood, and... I forgot to mention this, but we finally got a random with Astral, so we'll send we'll send the Astral one along as well. Most sites generate a couple of magic gems per turn, but there's a wide variety of them. Some will generate units, some will allow you to do particular kinds of spells you can't otherwise do, some will generate resources, there's just a huge variety of them. Anyway, that is everything that I want to talk about this turn. Alright, it is I believe turn 10, and we are starting to get slightly more complex lists of stuff happening. As you can see, we've successfully conquered two provinces. I'm not going to bother watching these in detail. I did warn the barbarians are incredibly dangerous and hit very hard. As you can see, they're the only thing that's been any kind of a real threat to our giants so far, wiping out six of them. We just had a couple of unexpected events, a bad one, and also a bad one. Oh no, it's too real. We've also had a new famous hero. This is a mechanic where all of the commanders in the game are are tracked and ranked by the game's system, and the game keeps a top 10 ranking of the, the 10 best heroes in the game, and each of those heroes, for as long as they are in that top 10 ranking, gains a unique bonus power. Most of these are stat boosts, so there's one that makes you have much higher attack, one that makes you have very high morale, one that makes you have extra hit points, that kind of thing. The one we got is obesity which I've never seen before, and supposedly makes them larger. However, although it says he's a bigger size, his actual size category is the same. He hasn't gone from four to five. However, he is gaining more hit points and uh, more strength, which is good for him. Not that he's ever going to be in melee. There's very often a few mercenaries in that Hall of Fame, but whoever's doing the most fighting will usually have a few commanders with it, and everybody else pretty much just gets their profit or nothing. So, in terms of orders, we're continuing our plan here. We're sending uh, Yord back home to go continue researching and compensating or something is going to take her troops and head down here and then to here. I think we have enough troops here to take both of these provinces. We're also sending out uh, a conquering party from here. One turns recruitment on Sigan, who's going to go here and then here and start uh, grabbing these before it's too late. This party I've dithered over for a little while. We could very easily take this province. Lion tribe are not very tough. And this would be important because this is a guy's territory, but so is this. And the risk with the particular layout I have is that I run up against the guys to my east and my west, and I'm kind of sealed in without any access to my the whoever's at my northeast and my, you know, northeast, southeast, northwest, southwest. Taking this province specifically both ensures that I have a passage into the lands of whoever's to my southeast in case I want to go to war with him at some point without having to deal with whoever's here being in the way. And it also would seal this throne into my territory. If I did that, the only people who could march on this throne would be Pelagia and me. Future Tessa here in a rare audio interruption. Sorry to cut into this broadcast, but I have just discovered mid-edit that a double-scrolling game map is not in fact a representation of a globe, but is a representation of a Taurus. A donut. This is wild. We are all dead serious as we duel to the death over the fate of donut world. I can't... I, I don't... I don't know how well my opponents have been expanding. I think they might be going a bit slowly, which is not surprising in a newbie game. And this is my third ever game, don't forget. But I have watched a shitload of, of YouTubes about this game, and my, my partner loves this game. She plays it way more than I do. So I have had just passive insights from her constantly talking about about this cool game and how to do this and oh well when you're expanding you want to do this and I, I'm nodding and smiling and going yeah yeah of course sweetie definitely. What I think I'm going to do is head north to grab these because having a, a wider buffer and just more territory overall is going to be really useful to me and my next party I think I will send this way or possibly even I'll just have this party loop around and grab this if it's still free at that point. I could potentially even grab this barbarian province later. As it is a barbarian province, it probably won't be captured for a while, so it will just be sitting there waiting for me. I do want to mention something that I should have mentioned probably in turn one that I forgot. So whenever I click on a province, you see these yellow lines? Those are direct connections. Any province connected by a yellow line, you can just march right into. 
Mountain ranges like this block direct connections. Some mountain ranges have mountain passes in, which are open during the summer or when your heat scales are high enough. Some mountain ranges have mountain passes, which are open when the heat in the province is high enough, either because it's summer or because you're, you have heat scales in your nation, but are otherwise impassable, and some are just completely impassable like this one. Blue connections are connections into water, which means you have to be able to go underwater to go through them. There, but there are also rivers. Oh, look, see, that's a mountain pass like I was talking about. This red connection indicates that it's a mountain pass. I believe the existence of a river imparts some kind of bonus to the provinces, but uh, yeah, if there is also a bridge, you can just freely cross it with a direct connection. However, there are also provinces without direct connections, such as these two, where there is a river with no bridge. If you have cold scales or it's cold enough because it's winter, you can cross you can cross a river connection because the river is frozen over. Uh, this means that we can effectively sail across rivers as Jotunheim because our dominion will make it cold enough to cross. So this is just another thing which you have to factor in when you're doing your strategizing. And also it should be mentioned that the distance you can travel on the campaign map is dictated by uh, the slowest unit in your party. So this guy has listed as 14 brackets 12, that means his map movement is 14, but the slowest unit he's commanding is 12, which means they travel at speed 12. However, that's not the only factor, it also factors in what you're travelling across. There is a basic cost for travelling across plains, but travelling through a forest is more expensive, travelling through highlands is more expensive, travelling through mountains is more expensive. So it all adds up. And um, this is one of the reasons why I will be using Wolf Rider Scouts from time to time. Oh, that's another thing. I've recruited three Scouts, I believe. There's a couple provinces which will have Scouts next turn, including a second Wolf Rider in this province, whose job is going to be to just jump the fuck across the terrain. Anyway, that's going to be all for this turn. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe and share. I also stream regularly on Twitch, and you can find me on Twitter for updates and announcements. If you want to contribute to my continued existence, then why not donate to me on Coffee or Patreon? All of the links are in the description. Thank you so much for watching.